We'll now call this work, regular workshop meeting of the Jackson City Council order. Council, uh, you have a proposed agenda for tonight's workshop in front of you. Mm -hmm. I would entertain a motion. To Move it. approval. Second. A motion and second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed. Now, I want to remind everybody that's in present tonight, this is a workshop. This is There is no public comment in this uh, particular uh, function of the council. So at this time, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Dr. Woodruff to introduce the first topic on the Great Lady Signage. Okay. Mayor and council members, thank you very much. Uh, several months ago, I believe in December, we talked with you about gateway signage. And at that time, there was a request that we add to the gateway signs the moniker uh, or logo of the TDA. This was sent out to you over the Christmas holidays, but I recognize that due to the holidays, many of you did not get a chance to give input. This is the design that the staff is recommending to you. You will notice it has the city logo on one end, and to balance the, uh, the overall design, so it is similar to the Memorial Garden sign. It does not have a baluster at both ends. So this is what we would recommend to you. We are in the position now, once you give us direction, to proceed with the actual specifications to send it out for bid. What are your thoughts? Are you comfortable with this design, or would you prefer other options? Council input. You've not gotten any comments back from any council member. No, sir. This. But given the fact that it was over the holidays, we weren't sure that many of you had had a chance to actually study it. I mean, I think it's fine. It's going to be in two or three places. Well, it would actually become, the answer is at least two or three places and maybe more based upon your specific approval to locate. You know, in, eventually it would be nice to have one of these on 17 as you head out towards uh, Newburn. Right. Also on 24, as you come in close to the railroad tracks, just near Piney Green, okay. uh, this first sign would be located at the intersection of Piney Green and Country Club. Right. Right. And there may be other locations that you would approve. Mm -hmm. I would also remind you that, uh, that this is funded uh, using DOT and to a degree, uh, maybe some TDA money on some of the other ones. And there's two similar ones going to be at the, up here near Beirut and one at the, I mean, one at the Beirut Grove. Right. Well, we're still working on the design for the ones at the Beirut Memorial Grove. Okay. Uh, they would not be this large. They may be more vertical, but we're still working with the base and also the Beirut Memorial right. Committee or the, uh, yeah, the, the Lejeune the Garden Committee. signs, not the Grove mm -hmm. signs, right? Okay, let me answer that differently. Thank you, Ron. The signs at the Grove itself have already been approved, and they will look, one of them will look very similar to this. <laughs> On the other hand, over here at the Memorial Gardens, we're right. working with the base and the committee there to determine what similar signage should be erected at that location. So we proposed similar, right? If I remember. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Was it two posts or one? Do you remember? Well, right now we have two proposed. You know, you have uh, there at the Memorial Gardens because you have basically a corner lot. So we're looking to identify the proper locations for those, and those will come back to you. Looks fine to me. It's like good. Good. Right. Everybody good with that? Any comments? No. Just, uh, just the, uh, you know, I'm still not sure what, what the purpose of the TDA sign on there is, but, but I'm not against it. I mean, you know, it looks fine. So. All right, let's move to the next agenda item. Uh, at the last meeting, Chief, would you join me, please? At the last meeting, we talked with you about changing the regulations relative to uh, record. As you will recall, the current regulations require the wrecker and storage lot to be located inside the city or to be located within the ETJ. As we've explained to you, that is worked well until we began to sub substantially reduce the amount of ETJ. We also know that one of our long-term record companies has recently lost their site in the ETJ because of DOT right-of-way purchase. And so what we asked at the last meeting is would you consider some other options? 
So the chief and I would like to talk with you for a few minutes about options. Here are some options for you to think about, and then we're going to show you some more information. One option is to locate within a specific dist distance from the city limits. Since we know the ETJ may eventually go away, or maybe three or four years from now, you may have another reduction in the ETJ, why not set the distance from the city limits line? Now, it's true, the city limits line may grow, but unlike the ETJ, it's not going to shrink. So one option would be to pick a mileage, 5 miles, 10 miles, 15 miles out. This option would eliminate the concern that Mr. Warden and others of you expressed about having a storage yard all the way down at Sneeds Ferry and someone who has a wreck on Western Boulevard having to go way down there or go all the way up to Richlands. Option two, locate within a specific distance from a significant point. For example, you're going to see a map in a minute. Western and Marine Boulevard, the vast majority of our wrecks occur where? Western Boulevard. So in this case, since you're talking about the importance of time to respond, what you may do is say, that's the epicenter, Western and 17, and so we're going to set the distance from there. The third would be something like this. Allow grandfathering when the NCDOT, the city, or some governmental entity requires relocation. Now, what does that actually mean? It would mean you keep your city code where it has to be located in the city limits or in the ETJ. But if your site is taken out of the ETJ by governmental action, you'd be grandfathered in. Or if your site was bought by the DOT, you'd be grandfathered in. Now, there's going to be some complication there because obviously if you buy the site, you can't be grandfathered in at that site. So you'd have to set some regulations as to where you could move to. Fourth is no location requirement, just simply must respond within a set time. And number five, only allow companies one entry on the list. If you remember, currently uh, the data showed that we have a number of companies that actually have four records. The vast majority only have one. Mike is going to show you in a few minutes that if you go out certain distances, there are already record companies that are not in the ETJ and not in the city limits, and they will now be eligible to be added to the rotation list. And if they add just one record, it's one thing. If they add two, three, or four, it becomes another thing. So let's look a second. Current towing entities. If you notice, out here to the far left is James Body Shop. You asked us the other day, how did that get to be on the rotation because it's not in the ETJ? And our answer was, we honestly can't figure that one out. But they've been on the rotation. Goins, on the other hand, is directly across the street from James, but they're not on the rotation list because they're not in the ETJ or in the city limits. They are the company that is losing or has lost their space because of the DOT purchase. You can see some of the others. Cox, for example. Cox was in the ETJ at one time. We reduced the ETJ. They're no longer on the rotation list because they lost it because they weren't in the ETJ. You can see you know, some of the other towing companies around. If you look at the city limits ranges, this, I believe that Glenn told me that this is the five mile range from the city limits. But this just shows you, you know, certain distances. This one shows you even further out. So if you wanted to go out 10 or 15 miles, you would set how far out it would go. And you can see that James body is um, about six miles out from the city limits line there. And again, you know, here's a close-up of that same thing. If you did it from not the city limits line, but from Western and Marine, once again, you could set up five-mile rings, 10-mile rings, whatever. The key is service delivery time. It's not location. It's how quickly can you get to the wreck. 
You all made an excellent point the other day that when you are tying up a police officer for a wreck anywhere and they have to wait 30 minutes, that's a lot of time. And usually you're not just tying up one police officer, you're tying up several. And sometimes the fire department, sometimes EMFs. And guess who else you're tying up? The general public. The longer it takes to clear that traffic, the more inconvenience it is for everyone. Driving time, if you notice uh, the colors, you may see the colors a little bit better than I can. But if you notice, there is a color for uh, 10 to 12 minutes, this is from Western and Marine, and then one to two minutes. Now I'm quite, I'll be honest with you, I'm not so sure how you can get some of these locations in one to two minutes. But again, driving time is important. There are your options. I'd like to ask Mike if he would add some uh, statistical information that they've looked at. Please. So, so uh, we've looked at how many wreckers, if you moved out to the five or 10 mile uh, limit, would add 20 more record services. And that's th that's just services that we know of. There could be other services as well that are in that area. So it'll, it'll take us some time to manage those uh, additional time because they have to be inspected every year. They have to be, um, they have to be uh, managed from our, our telecommunicator standpoint. And then if there's an issue with any of them, then we have to have hearings and do investigations and. A number of things. Is that 20 companies or 20 records? 20 companies. So each, if 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 they wanted to have four according to the code, that would be 80 record services that would uh, could have the potential to be on the list. Because right. each 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 record has the ability to have four different uh, companies if they have four different companies. And one of the things that we would recommend to you because. You know, certainly uh, government is not supposed to regulate free enterprise, but I think you would all agree that if everybody went to the max, this thing could get out of control where it's very difficult to manage. So one thing that we would recommend is that we seriously look at the number of records, or record companies that one group can own. Because as you know, right now, there are several that own four. The vast majority only own one. I need, I need clarification. I mean, you know, one, so I have a lot. Now, if I got four records, does that mean that, is that the four you're talking about? Or am I sitting on one lot with four different, four, the four companies, different locations? Four different no. So what happens is, is they have four different companies under one roof. Oh, okay. And like so each company, people. each company is on um, right. the, the record. Like they could have mics, they could have Uneros, they could have something else quality quality, quality record blue so i could have record a blue record so i could have four different companies mm -hmm. as long as i have four different business mm -hmm. licenses and that would give me four different slots on the list so the list goes through a rotation so we call record a one day record b the next record c the next and the code allows for a particular company to have up to four records so that company could be a b c and d yes but so one company can have four records, right? Okay. But it, 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 and so if you think gonna about go it, if you think about it as in slots, so they could have four different slots on our rotation. How many slots are in there now? We have twenty. Uh, I believe it's twenty nine slots that are on there right now. I mean, it's this but that's that's not twenty nine companies. That's twenty nine records. Records. Okay. How many companies? Companies is there right now? Well. If we can, uh, Glenn, Go ahead. Uh, if you would look at the hidden slides from our last presentation, you should yeah. find a slide that shows the companies and how many have uh, one slot and how many have multiple slots. Would you please find that? I believe it's him. Please join us at the table. Yeah, here it is. Uh, my number's a little different than Mike's. We'll accept Mike's, please. Uh, we show 22 entities on the list, but actually 12 companies. Mm -hmm. That two companies had four locations, two companies had three locations, and eight companies had one location. Mm -hmm. So, Mike, to see if I understand this correctly, the eight companies that have one location, they can actually have four records. Is that right? They can have multiple records. They just operate, but they can only respond to one slot. Right, correct, right. Okay. 
So it's not they, like they might have two or three wreckers, but they only have one company, one slot in in the rotation. The the two companies, two of those companies have four slots in those locations. Because they have different names. Right. Right. Well, I mean, you really can't. I mean, I guess you could get into that, but you're getting mighty complicated when you get into trying to research what company, who really, what's the background on. Some of it's going to be self-regulating. I mean, if you get too many in there, people are going to drop off because it's not going to be worth the effort. That's true. So uh, I'm not so sure I want to get into trying to figure out Bob and Randy's or Randy and Bob's or, you know, <laughs> that seems a little... And big. that's 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 probably why, uh, and I wasn't here when they changed the code, that's probably why they did it the way they did it. So that uh, they wouldn't get into, well, my mother owns this company right. or my brother owns this company. And, um, even though it's the same record that may come out on four different locations. What are the penalties for, uh, I guess, showing up late to a location to try to turn a wreck or, I mean, some other issue that may they, come up? How do you penalize? Typically, we'll suspend them from the... Uh, from the list, from the rotation list. So we can suspend them for a week, we can suspend them for a month, we can suspend them for a year, we can suspend them indefinitely. The other thing we do, there's a 30 minute response time. 30 minute response And time. after 30 minutes, if they're not there, we simply call the next company on the list and if the first company shows up, we send them home. And they're, they're, they go to the bottom of the list. So they lose that slot. If they if, lose when we're talking time. about actually augmenting that uh, at times, time. so maybe 20 minutes. 25 or minutes 20, or 20 to 25 or minutes. Whichever do you, you guys see fit. Do you find your officers doing that a lot or a little in the um, current model? I mean, typically we don't because they, they know the repercussions of that. Okay. So, so right now they're pretty accurate. They get Typically they're there time. very, very quickly and... They understand that they're under that 30 minute time limit. And so, and, and plus they lose that, that slot and it goes all the way back to, to 22. Uh, they're number 22 on the list. So it takes some time to get that up. Well, I still think there should be some limitations on distance. If, if not for anybody, but the person whose car has been towed mm -hmm. uh, to be able to easily retrieve that vehicle. I think that's something that really needs to be given you know primary thought on this thing and I, and I think that was the reason for the ETJ versus the city <clears throat> limits and I think uh, I had the opportunity to talk to a number of chiefs when I was in uh, in Cherokee and uh, that's why theirs are written the way they are is to try to keep somebody from having to drive 20 or 30 miles you know when their car is towed in order to retrieve it you just call on the rotation list. You only call for accidents, correct? You don't do it for like seizures of vehicles. Um, well, we do it for we do it primarily for accidents, but we will do it for other things like an abandoned car in the middle of the road, or anything that's non-consensual that we tow. We uh, we use the record list except for seizures. Seizures since. Since we'll be responsible for the bill, um, we have somebody contracted specifically right. for that. And remember, this has nothing to do with an individual who chooses on their own to select a company. Mm -hmm. So whether you're on the rotation list or not, if you have an accident and you prefer, you know, A, B, C towing, then you have the right to tell the officer, "I'd, I'd like to have A, B, C towing call." But but there is a 30-minute time limit according to the code that they have to respond there. So we can't leave the intersection blocked for an extended period of time. What, what I'm hearing is that what we have works fine. Y'all are satisfied. The response time is good. There's, there's enough competition, um, but yet it's not a burden for you to do the inspections. What's happened is we've had a, had a, a change in the ETJ. We could take care of that by grandfathering those current records companies that are currently on the list, even though they lost their spot, they're grandfathered in. You still keep, you still keep the time, you still be strict and equitable in that, that, uh, and how you enforce that. 
and and you just grandfather those who have lost through no fault of their own they've lost their location you haven't increased you haven't have to worry about it, uh, allowing too many in to become a, a inspection burden for you you still have plenty of uh, i think competition you've got plenty of uh, opportunities for for folks to to make a living and I don't think it's un I don't think we would be unfair grandfathering those who who lost uh, what they what they had. They no fault of theirs. So are you, if, if I may, are you generally in favor then of the wording on number three? Allow grandfathering when NCDOT, yeah. city, or some governmental yeah. entity keep, requires keep, relocation. Keep what we've got. Okay. Keep the keep the city limit and ETJ. That addresses. Uh, the concerns that we might have about how far a citizen has to travel to go get their vehicle. Keep the 30 minute because we're concerned about speed and addressing, clearing the, the wreckage for, for police, fire, and for the citizens. And, and then continue to, and then put in the grandfathering when it requires relocation so that they, they've not been adversely affected by you no know, fault of their own. And I might add, we, we probably should think about, you know, how how that how that's going to work because we wouldn't want them to be in Sneeds Ferry or. So we can work out the details. Right. Well, this, you know, if if they've lost their if they've lost, <coughs> if it's just uh, we we did away with the ETJ in that area, they their location's still there. You you might have a situation where DOT buys buys their property, they're going to have to relocate. I would say they're still grandfathered. But they still have to meet that 30 minute response time. If they don't meet the 30 minute response time, that's they're, they're not going to be able to, to, to meet our requirements. Mr. Carter, you got a comment on it? No, sir. I, I think Mr. Warden was hitting it that how do you deal with a person who the DOT takes their property? Uh, that person can't stay there, so they've got to relocate. Where do they relocate? We'll have to devise a perimeter of what would be acceptable to council as to where they may have to relocate but again they're grandfathered in because of that governmental action but i think that i mean i think we can make it happen and does, because does location automatically assume that's the storage site too yes sir it has to be the storage site is has really to be, they're synonymous and we have to inspect the storage site and it has to be uh, so some some folks have two locations the business location and then the storage location so there could be two locations but it it all those uh those have to be inspected on a yearly basis but the storage location has to be within that right okay. Okay. So within 30 minutes yes we we'll no, within the etj or city the city limits, limits. Mm -hmm. yeah. or or like i said one thing that you might do is when the DOT is the one forcing you to relocate, because obviously you're not keeping them in the same place, we're going to have to work out where that storage lot could go. But if that's the general direction you're comfortable, that helps us as a staff, and we'll bring you back more detail that hones in on that number three suggestion. So I'd just like to add, I think good. that uh, it looked to me like James is the furthest distance. So maybe that could be our parameter. We can look at that, you know, since that's, you've already got that one established. Okay. Thank you very much for the direction, Chief. Thank you all for the excellent work. And by the way, I, I have to, once again, uh, the city police department and the fire department just do an excellent job responding to emergencies, especially traffic emergencies. Uh, you guys do an excellent job, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Michael and Susan, please. Okay, let's see. Um, Lynn, can we go to the first slide? These are the hidden slides. Sorry about that. We, we opened up the hidden slide folder. We're going back to last meeting. Okay. Two weeks ago when we worked on this, you ask us to hold a special meeting of the Recreation Parks Advisory Committee. You have a, several of them who are in the audience with us tonight. That meeting occurred on Tuesday of last week. I believe it was at four o'clock. Yes, sir. And it was over at the uh, Commons at the, we no longer call it the Senior Center because 
uh, one council member goes over there regularly for exercise, and he says he is not a senior. So uh, we now call it the, the adult, adult center. center. Although his wife questions whether he's actually an adult, just as my wife questions my adult. He's a, he's a Randolph Jr., so he did not mean the definition of senior. Okay. I figured out what's wrong with it at this point, because you're always excited when you're a senior in high school. You're always excited when you're a senior in college. But you really hate to graduate when you're a senior. So <laughs> that's for sure. Uh, at the meeting, uh, Susan, Susan did an excellent job going through the options which we had shown to you. In that discussion, though, we brought up two additional options that we shared or came out of the discussion with the Recreation and Parks Advisory Committee. I'd like to spend a minute talking to you about those two options. On Tuesday morning of last week, uh, Michael and Susan, Alan Baker and I met, and Ron, met with uh, John Sawyer, who's the architect who has worked with us on the Jack M. Yett facility and other city facilities. From that, we came up with another option, which we call option seven. Option seven would be to keep the community center. That is the building in white on the right. It would remove the current gym. It would build on the current site a multi-purpose center and it would expand the community center. Cost estimate, one and a half to two million dollars. Now, the green would be the expansion of the community center. The white, of course, is the current community center. And the blue would be your multi-purpose center. The multi-purpose multi center would be capable and would actually be larger than the current gym that has been used for however many years to play basketball. So it's not like you are, are eliminating basketball. On the other hand, as the advisory committee talked, and Mr. Jackson did a very good job as your liaison, they said they would prefer to build a full-size gym there, that you would keep the community center as it currently is, you would build, you would remove the current gym, you would build on the current side a full-size gym. Our cost estimate is two and a half to three million dollars. Richard, quick yes, question, sir. is that in addition to the renovation of the community center? Yes, community center? Uh, well let's go back. Okay. In both diagrams, the community center has already been rehabbed. If you have a chance to go by, I think you'll be very pleased. It's okay, in so operation. So it's in its current format, you would yes. just be adding on. Okay, what we you. would do in both of these though, is as you notice in both graphics, the parking is on the back side and the entrance is on the front side on uh, South Drive. What we would recommend in either of these options is that you would enter from the parking lot and you would come around by the playground and if you notice the little white area between the blue and the white box with the black, that would become a central corridor so you would come from the parking lot up past the uh, 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 playground, go through the atrium, similar to what you have at uh, Jack Hemi at uh, Surgeon City. You would then enter the community center from the back side, not the south drive, and you would enter the gym from that same corridor. Those are just concepts. And under either court, under either concept that would be something that we would recommend. Reverse how you use the, the site. What we recommend to you is this. Go ahead and eliminate the options one through six. Now to be technical, we only showed you five. I can't figure out what option six was. But eliminate those. Authorize us to move forward with John Sawyer, the architect, to analyze both option seven and option eight. Have them perform the feasibility study to make sure that both options would fit on the site, that they would identify other issues that we haven't even thought about. One thing we do know is this, if you expand the building, you're going to have to address stormwater. The more impervious area you have, then you're going to have to address stormwater. The other thing that they would give you is an opinion of probable cost. I mean, I can tell you, Mr. Warden does this a lot better than I do. These are swags. My estimate for option seven is one and a half to two million. 
It may be a little more. I don't think it'd be any less. On option A, these are my swags, two and a half to three and a half million. It may be more. I don't think it would be less. But what this would give you is several things. Number one, it would begin to focus us on what we're gonna do in that community, in that park. Number two, it would then give you what I'm gonna call professional opinions on the site plan and professional opinions on the cost. That way you have the best possible accurate information to decide which option should we go with. What we do know is the city needs to move forward with Jack M. Yet. Uh, yeah. You know, we finally got the insurance settlement of 750000 plus or minus dollars. Mm -hmm. We know that there's not going to be any FEMA money to come to rescue us. And we know that that community deserves and needs a facility, whether it's option seven or option eight. As the old saying goes, it's time for us to get on. So I would recommend, and I'd ask Council Member Jackson, since he was the liaison, uh, you know, this came out of the advisory group on Tuesday of last week. Uh, sir, thoughts? I agree with moving forward with, uh, with you know, discussing those two options. You know where I stand concerning the gymnasium. Also, I know you all have a challenge with programs, space as well, and offices. So just maximizing those spaces based on the needs and see what, see what we get from there. Also, I was wondering, have you all looked at any other funding streams? Like, I don't know if there's grants out there, maybe even to add for your programs or particular programs. I don't know about operations, because a lot of times you do know, operations, those are challenges with grants. But I was just wondering if you had looked at, you know. We know that there are grants out there. One of the bigger ones is the part of, and we just closed our part of grant out for the marina. So there are grants out there. It's certainly something we can look at. What they want to see on a part of grant is new elements added. So replacing a facility with the same like facilities wouldn't right. qualify. It has to be added recreational opportunities. But there are other grants we're always willing to look into and see if we can apply for them. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, we got smart people see how creative we can get. Absolutely. Show the two options again. Seven. Yes, sir. And I have a question. What is a full-size gym? I mean, I understand what a the official floor plan. You know, feet versus, what I'm saying, that's the, the, price that's the court, 80, that's the court itself. 50 to 84, and then you have to have room outside of that. That's what I'm saying. Is it going to be... The, the one that's the there now is 60. Know, is it true size? <clears throat> you don't know. Well, it's what you decide, I would think. How yes, and, and let's let's think about, uh, you know, let's use the okay. one at the bottom of the comments, the 50 by 84. Now, uh, the gym height is a minimum of 25 feet. This says 30, because that's what the commons is. But, you know, for those people like Mr. Warden who like the high arcing three, you know, three length court, three quarter court shot, he's got to have 25 feet to get the basket. Minimum. Minimum. So, if you look at the court, you have to also remember, you got to have area behind the backboard. You got to have area on both sides. You got to decide, are you going to have any stands? Now, I will tell you, the one at, at the Commons, uh, you've got stands on both sides. And I would say to you, I think you should have some bleachers in this new facility, but not on both sides. This is not going to be tournament you know, <coughs> play, play. Uh, you, because you are going to use it in either option for your smaller children <coughs> or maybe larger children. You need a place for parents who've driven them there to sit <laughs> instead of uh, standing around. So... <coughs> You know, pick a number. I would say that if the court's 50 feet wide, you need 10 feet on one side just for passage. And you're going to need at least another 20 to 30 feet on the other side for passage and for some uh, bleachers. So if you add 10 to 50 and 10 more and 20 more, you know, pretty soon you're getting out, let's say 60, 70, that's like 90 feet. At the ends, you know, you could add 10 feet on both. I can tell you that back in the dark ages, before they invented electricity and I played basketball, I played in a gym in Everglades, Florida. Using peach the, baskets, right? That's right, using <laughs> peach baskets. And the, and the basketball goal was two feet away from the end wall. Yeah, and all it took was one time going down for a layup at the wrong angle, and you learn very quickly. 
You need more, you need a different angle. So, you know, when you look at these dimensions, that's why having an architect work with us to actually show you the true. Yeah, what's the capability? Yeah. Mr. Richard, what do you thought, think the potential cost would be to do that? Oh, I, I think for that, uh, we're talking just, you know, nominal money, ten, fifteen thousand okay. dollars And okay. it's the type of thing that you need regardless. Even if you pick uh, an option tonight, you need an architect to give you the concept plan and so the opinion of problem cost. Mm -hmm. I thought when we had the citizen survey that the majority of the people wanted something on a multi-purpose facility rather than a basketball court. Yes, sir. A lot of folks wanted programming space, computer space, fitness rooms, those sort of things. Um, I don't have them in front of me. I apologize, but uh, a Seems lot of like folks. We're discussing right now more of a basketball facility than a multi-purpose center. And then there were folks that also asked for in an in indoor gym space. It was pretty split. It was a little bit depending on the question. But well, Mr. Bittner, if you look at option seven, uh, that's what we were trying to do as a staff. Uh, give you a multi-purpose building that could house basketball yeah. and have a lot of events. But if you notice the green area, we would also be expanding the community center. Now, you could also do the same thing with option eight. Uh, you know, that's going to add some cost to that, but you could still, under option eight, have an expansion of your community right. center component. That is substantial and more uh, increased cost. Yes, sir. Well, let's get, let's uh, let's go ahead and uh, could I, Mr. So, go ahead. I, I'd like could I since we're going to eliminate one through five or six, could I see those real quick? Just uh, you've got if you got them summarized somewhere. I'm sure it's Glenn does somewhere in this computer. Before, computer before I say uh, yay, because uh, you were saying with a multi-purpose uh, facility. It wouldn't be a basketball court in particular, right? Is that what you were saying? Uh, yeah, I don't envision necessarily a basketball court. I envision goals. I just yeah. envision more of a multi-purpose space that we could utilize for, like Mr. Bittner said, some other opportunities. I think we could put goals in there. I just don't know that it would be solely But, but, if, but if we could figure out, we could use a, a, a facility with a gymnasium as a multi-purpose space. Sure. Uh, Glenn, can you pull it up from option one, please? I found option three. Maybe hidden, hidden. Okay. Maybe, maybe in the secret files there, not the hidden one, but the secret one. One of them. Well, option one. There we go. There we go. Option one was basically to renovate the existing center as is. Okay. That was option one. Option two, and there's an example of what option one looks like another. Option two would be to tear down the facility completely and only build a community center. It would not have a gymnasium of any sort. Option three, option three would be to build a large facility back near uh, the, uh, the school, and it would have one large court, and you would move everything from where it is today. <coughs> option four would be to build two full-size courts, and you can see, you know, uh, where that would be located. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm definitely out against four there. So. <laughs> and then option five would be to try to build two courts up on the current site. And then option six we can't find because apparently I couldn't count, and that's why I went to option seven. So again, uh, option seven is uh, option seven and option eight. We'd like to ask your permission to move forward and study and then bring you back the analysis. I'm okay with that. Yeah, me too. Mm -hmm. Time frame? I'd like to do it uh, by April because at the end of the day, we've got a capital improvement program that you're going to be looking at and trying to fund. Is everybody good with that? I'm, I'm, good, with that. I'm good with that. Yeah. I do want to mention, though there wasn't a, there was some that didn't actually, you know, fill out the survey, but I got a lot of interest in it afterwards and actually a lot of those folks did come um come by to offer support for it so i'm glad to see what moving forward in this direction thank you thank you, thank you. Oh, I think that's good. Uh,
Uh, I think Wally and his staff are ready now for the uh, road resurfacing. Okay. And gentlemen, I'm going to yield my seat. Now, Wally came with his bodyguards in case you're right. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening, folks. Um, Good evening. My name is Jason Miles. I'm the senior civil engineer for the city, and I'm going to present to you our city road resurfacing program. Uh, the map shown here indicates our city maintained streets in red. Uh, the total is about 165 miles. Uh, there's an additional roughly 68 miles of NCDOT and private streets as well. Tonight I'll specifically address funding, our pavement rating system, evaluation and repair, costs associated with repairs, upcoming projects, and funding alternatives. How Bill is a street aid program by the state of North Carolina to incorporated municipalities in the state. Mm -hmm. State funds are derived from fuel taxes and can be used for uh, repair and maintenance, uh, repaving or rehabilitation, and constructing and widening of existing streets. Funds can also be used for bikeways, greenways, or sidewalks, including ADA improvements. The total state appropriation is $147.5 million. The distribution of funds is based on population and road mileage as indicated here, uh, the 1935 per person, about 75% of the funds, again, based on population, 25% of the funds based on road mileage or 1590 per mile. Jacksonville allocation is 1.7 million this year. It's important to note that our funding has diminished over the previous five years due to increased development throughout the state competing for the same pot of money. So we did have an increase last year, right? Uh, we had an increase in the number of or the street mileage yes. um, from mile bills. up to 165 miles, yes, sir. And it came, what we found is when we had reported previously, some of our streets, um, you know, when we may have a, you know, just pick, we may have a Doris Road and a Doris Court, and what we found is in some cases, the court may have gotten reported, but the road or the street did not. It wasn't every case, but for some reason, we, we had um, the, the court or street that were named the same thing. One may have gotten dropped off for some reason. We don't know if that was off the map or off the street listing. So our street number mileage went up, but what we found it through an audit was that we had some missing um, courts or, or streets. Can you go back to the previous slide for a second? This one here? Yeah, based on population. So are those census numbers when you talk about? Yes. yes so that's mm -hmm. another reason why it's important. Yeah. Right, exactly. exactly. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yes, sir. Our city budgeting um, is generally split between streets maintenance and capital projects to include pedestrian and ADA improvements. Um, this slide here indicates kind of how it's tipping up. And one other thing I'd like to add to that is, um, as we program our capital projects, the anything that we don't use in street maintenance, which would be, which would fall under um, Kelly Cannon's area, he's our new street superintendent, been with us just under a year now, I guess. And, um, Anything that's not used for maintenance out of that 890 that we budget automatically rolls into our capital improvement uh, project fund. So, for example, if, he'll, if they only use 750,000, then that, that extra 140 would roll into being able to use it for additional paving of road mileage. 
This is a simple graphic of our pavement condition rating system. Uh, our assessment considers how much or the quantity, what type, and how bad the severity of pavement. Our pavement condition rating system breaks down streets into segments which are independently rated based on 13 criterion. Uh, we're looking at reducing that criterion down to 10. So it's a little bit redundant perhaps. But, uh, a numerical and letter value is assigned based on our evaluation. Our engineering evaluation, sorry, catch up here. Our engineering evaluation considers pavement condition rating, street classification such as collector, cul-de-sacs, etc., amount of traffic, number of street segments that need to be repaved, condition of utilities, geotechnical observations, including poor drainage. It's important to note that we try to do a thorough evaluation of our under, underground utilities uh, and address those problems before repaving associated streets. So Henderson Drive was a, a good example of that, even though that's going to be repaved by DOT, uh, we went out and addressed all of the underground utility issues uh, beforehand. Our focus for street projects prior to 2013 generally addressed below average and poor streets uh, graded as D's, uh, failed and very poor streets graded as E's. Uh, project types included full reconstruction and pavement reclamation. Our focus for street projects after 2013 generally addresses fair condition streets or lower sea level streets. Uh, project types include repair of localized areas of failure, which is often done by our streets division, and milling and repaving, which is done by our contractors. Typical cost for mill and overlay versus reclamation is less than half. Uh, thus, we can stretch our dollars further through mill and overlay. Uh, please note that these costs do not include ADA improvements. Our annual repaving projects total approximately three miles per year. It depends on funding availability, width and condition of streets, drainage issues, and ADA requirements. Let me ask you a quick question about sure. the PDA requirements on that. Resurface in the, the street itself doesn't kick in any ADA it, requirement. It actually, actually does. does. Yes, uh, there's from Federal Highway Administration, uh, they basically said if you mill and resurface a street, then you have to upgrade the handicap ramps at the intersections. Do you don't have to come back and fix the sidewalk mm -hmm. along the entire roadway but you at least have to upgrade the handicap ramps at the intersections. Well, if you take, uh, just for the sake of knowing, what would be the cost of doing one of those ramps? It's about $1,500, give or take, right. per ramp. Mm -hmm. So it's not inexpensive, and you typically have four at every intersection. Our upcoming street projects, uh, fiscal year 19 street segments were catching up a bit. Uh, they've been designed and will go out in a bid packet soon. Our fiscal year 20 street segments include DeWitt Street, Shadow Ridge, Liberty, and we're currently evaluating five others. Uh, we have an increase of approximately one mile from fiscal year 19 to fiscal year 20. Um, the street list there for fiscal year 19 includes Center Street, Billis Drive, Parkwood Drive, Greenbrier Road and Court, Nottingham Road, Hyatt Circle, and Tweed Drive. I think it's important to note that we do street segments, um, as Jason mentioned earlier, so we may go from one block, you know, we'll do from one block to the next block, that's a street segment. Just because the street is listed, we may not do the entire length. And we do that trying to hit the areas that need to be repaired um, and stretching the life out of those streets that, um, you know, are in good condition and we can leave in place for a while longer. So that's why 
it's important to note those are street segments. It's not the entire, so we're not going to go repave all of Village Drive. It's only a certain segment. Um, and if you have any questions about which segments, we can provide that information to you later. Mm -hmm. Also, can people just call in to find out where their streets are in terms of future plans? We don't go, uh, we have a list and we have the grade. We can very easily pull up the grade of any street segment. Um, we only look out a couple of years at which streets are actually in there. And a large part of that is those underground utilities. You know, we may have a street that's in really bad shape, but if the utilities underneath of it are also in bad shape, then that one's much further out because of the cost of the project. <clears throat> As a reminder, we have 165 miles of city roads. Um, again, at three miles per year, you're looking at 40 plus years to address all of these streets. Uh, typical pavement design life is 20 years. So it will take 40 plus years to address our current total. Um, you know, and of course, new streets are added over that time frame. Our funding alternatives. Uh, Pound bill funds current funding level is 750,000 plus unused maintenance, fund, maintenance funds, uh, covers about three miles per year. Um, again, the average of 40 plus years uh, is, uh, is obviously outliving the design life of our pavements. This graphic indicates a potential funding alternative using license plate fees on top of the Powell bill uh, money, which covers about three miles. So for example, $25 license plate fee uh, can parlay into an additional 2.5 miles. The second funding alternative utilizes Powell bill plus the general fund supplements. Uh, so for example, Powell bill funds three miles uh, for every 500,000 we can fund about 1.5 miles uh, from the general fund. So uh, the second alternative. The third funding alternative is the Powell bill plus a quarter cent sales tax. Uh, so uh, considering about nine miles, again, Powell bill can cover about three miles. A quarter cent sales tax uh, adds about 2 million, which can cover approximately six miles given that 500,000 500, for 1.5 miles. Well, 20 years. Is it, is it just the three, three alternatives you got? Uh, I assume it could be a combination of alternatives as well. So, right, could so. so you say the sale of quarter cent sales tax would generate $2 million a year? That's what we took from the slide that we printed, we presented to you, I don't know, about a year ago. Well, I personally think that we tried once to get that. It didn't work out. Uh, we debated this one time before, and we've looked at these alternatives before, mm -hmm. and we know that the quarter cent sales tax is the way to go if we can ever get uh, our state uh, legislators to uh, our delegation to allow us the opportunity to put this before the voters. If the voters want, you know, the good roads, let them make that decision. You know, I mean, they want this to see an additional quarter cent. And the reason why I lean toward a quarter cents is that you get, you capture a, a bigger audience of, of people paying, not just people that pay taxes in the city, but people that use our roads that live outside the city. Yeah. So, I mean, that's that's why I will continue to lean towards that option personally. Uh, and I would, um, I, I'm planning on uh, addressing another letter to our legislative delegation, asking them to, to do this. I think we've had enough. Uh, we've had enough uh, generation of, of, of con concerns from the public about this condition of the roads here. Of course, hopefully, Henderson Drive being paved this spring, which we got that email today, may uh, help a lot of that uh, that consternation or whatever we're in. We've been catching over that, but uh, I, I just don't. I just don't like the idea of the license tax. I mean, it's just. 
That's not a good way to go about it. I think the only, only concern I have with that is that even if we got a courtesan sales tax, we're talking about maybe two years before we could, even if folks voted in favor of it. So I don't doing? remember. Do you remember the full timeline? It, it took a referendum. Yeah, yeah. The legislature approved a referendum, and there was some costs associated with that. Well, the concept that the mayor and council uh, authorized us to send to the delegation last year, if you recall, it was this. It would be a quarter cent. It would last for five years. That it would go to the public as a referendum. That the public would have to approve it. That all money generated by it would go to road resurfacing. It could not be sent off for drainage. It couldn't be sent off for sidewalks. It would go to road resurfacing. The other part is after five years, it would sunset. And if the public wanted to re-vote it, then they could. What we also know is that throughout the state, every municipality has the same issue. And Mr. Lozera was president of the North Carolina League of Municipalities. He did a great job in bringing this to the attention of all of the cities in our annual goal-setting meeting. And as a delegation, I'm sorry, as an association, the North Carolina League of Municipalities voted that as one of their top 15 goals, I believe it was, sir, or 10 goals. And I think what we should do is ask Mr. Lazara, well, although he's not president anymore, you are the pastor. 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 And so you still have a seat. What I would ask is that number one, we ask you to continue to push this at the state level for all cities to have the ability to have a referendum on. And number two, I agree with the mayor's idea that we send a letter out to our current delegation and ask them again, please authorize us to bring this as far as a referendum. Do we understand why we didn't succeed last time? Yeah, the county asked for was asking for half cent, half cent too, half cent. Well, yeah, the, the agreement was, to, <clears throat> the agreement was if they all didn't agree to it, it wouldn't move forward. It's a long story, but it's an issue that affects all of North Carolina. I mean, we have 80,000 miles of roads and failing bridges all across North Carolina and no revenues. What is the so license, thing about it? What's the license plate to forecast and revenue? <clears throat> I can go back and pull up that chart. 750000 up to $25. So if you recall, I believe you could actually go up to $30 on the <coughs> tag. But five dollars of that had to be transit. So five dollars could be used for any legal purpose that you could use, and then the other had to be for street paving, if I remember right. So you could go up to twenty-five. Well, the last we talked about that, I was opposed to it, thinking that the administrative costs are pretty heavy. Then I found out that the state would include that on your registration fee too. So your administrative costs are. Far less than what I thought. I think that but only the, the bad thing is you're already paying property tax every year on that deal. <laughs> yeah, that that, that, right. that right. puts an unadded burden to a lot of people. That's that's twenty five right. dollars is a lot of money to have. I didn't say I didn't think twenty five. You said up to twenty five. Well, oh, yes. yes. Wilmington, I think, so you can go five dollars. I think, yeah, I think sure. we need to talk real world, guys. Real world is that as long as a county insists that they want another half cent or quarter cent sales tax and we want a quarter cent for the road they're not they're not going to approve both so so we're going to be right back where we are right now I, I don't i don't see i mean if we, we've got an election maybe there'll be a change in, in feelings there but but with with that competing interest there they're not going to be able to support both but it's not, they're, they're just offering the opportunity. They're not it's the mandating. People's vote. They, they do it in South like Carolina. It, it works. They could they offer the people both. Yeah. Well, let, me, let, me, let me back up. If the election stands and reelects the current incumbents, that's not going to happen. That's right. We have a chance if we have a change, but without that cha change, it won't happen. So, so we're right back to where we are right now. The forecast for how Bill <laughs> I was reading a report someplace where I think one or two states they're increasing their vehicle registration fees three four hundred percent two hundred three hundred because gasoline tax revenues are falling because of 
the more availability of electric vehicles. But they're starting. North to, Carolina is going to do the same thing. They're starting to impose electric vehicle fees. That's what you said. Yeah, they're already doing this. They're recovering. Yeah, yeah they're, they're starting to recover, recover the losses. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you still you still seeing uh, increased uh, uh, gas mileage uh, per vehicle, so that's reducing the amount of uh, gas that people burn. That's there may be more vehicles on the road though, maybe to offset, but. The reality of that also is that that continues to decline. And I don't know that they, you know, we, we start talking about uh, the, the future and, and you get into ride sharing and uh, well, that is the future. Yeah, the sharing of, of vehicles, perhaps uh, you're going to see, I think you're going to see mileage continue to, to be an issue for our car tax. Well, I certainly, I certainly would still continue to pursue the course in sales tax. I mean, I think that's the, the best way to do it. And of course, we, we might be right back at the table here in about a month or two. If, if, I'm looking at a different way to do it. But, you know, if, I still think that's... I, I don't disagree that that's the most common sense. I just don't know that the political political will at, at, at that state level. And I don't know that the county's still asking for that money, Bob. Well, I, I, don't I don't know. I don't know either. Have we not in the past used some general funds? Dedicated uh -huh. some general funds? That's just what I was going right. to say. I thought we, well, I thought we we're carrying one point. We're carrying one in terms of fund balance. In the, uh, to answer your question, sir, in the 10 years that I've been here, we have not used fund balance. We have not used general fund subsidy. Uh, the current fund balance, uh, Gail is not in the audience, so she's in uh, council chambers. She's in council chambers. But the, the current fund balance uh, is pretty substantial. I would say to you that if you're going to use it, remember the experience from the hurricane. Uh, we had about six to seven million dollars worth of damage that we had to front. Yes, eventually we're going to get that back from either an insurance company or from FEMA. But if you look at some of the other communities in our area who haven't recovered at all, it was because they didn't have a fund balance. I would say to you, of all the options that were shown to you tonight, uh, none of them are good options, but the only option that you can actually control is the use of your fund balance. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I would also say to you that if you're going to do that, also remember this, it's your savings account. You would be spending non-recurring money for recurring expenses. So what I would say is this. If you want to use some of your fund balance, don't make a policy. Make a year statement that says for this coming paving in the spring, we're going to allocate X dollars. But don't set a policy that says from this day on you're going to do it simply because... <clears throat> You can't forecast the future. My, my, my comment there is last year, the NFY19, we added three and a half million dollars to our unobligated general fund because of various things that went on. The, the sales tax uh, uh, did, did well and so forth and so on. So I, I, I tend to agree with, with, with Dr. Woodruff there. I, you know, I, I think for FY21, we might be willing to, to take a, a portion of that money and, and say, uh, well, let's let's put it towards a one-time resurfacing to help right. catch up a little bit, take care of some of our worst. But but again, that's something we'll have to be looking at overall budget. We've got other yeah. other issues too. I so. wouldn't be opposed to that. I think we set a. I don't know whether it's still policy or not. At one time, we had a goal of a minimum fund balance of fifteen percent. Yes, sir. And maybe that should be the policy. We only look at paving money for fund balance in excess of that fifteen percent on a yearly basis. Well, you know, quick math, which and since Gail isn't here, I guess I can do math in public. If she was here, she wouldn't let me do it. I'm taking notes. So if, you, if you assume that the general fund is $50 million, then obviously 15% of that is a minimum of seven and a half million that you'd have to have for fund balance. Remember Hurricane Florence, the impact on Hurricane Florence was almost seven million. So, but I, even though your policy says the 15%. As a minimum. As a minimum. What your practice has been is substantially more. Mm -hmm. So if you're like, uh, which certainly it sounds like you would, 
uh, we can provide you with some information on your unobligated fund balance. Remember, the fund balance is made up of obligated and unobligated. Now, Gail and the auditors may use different terms. What's the difference? There's some things you have to keep in there and you can't spend. It's part of your fund balance, but you have it in there. Obligated. Then there's the unrestricted fund balance. So we'll get you some more information and then you can decide. Yes, sir. I think I think with the next item that perhaps this is something that needs to be included in that or is included in that conversation. Okay. Also, we can certainly do that. Okay. Yes, sir. Are the streets graded? <clears throat> what period? Of, how period? Or how often are you assigned the grades to the streets? We long? we grade them internally. The last time it was done was in at the beginning of FY nineteen. Yes, FY nineteen. So two years so, ago. Yeah. So, so we try to do it at least every three years. Every three years, okay. Yes. I have a question before we end it on sidewalks. Are we still using the philosophy on sidewalks to keep adjoining rather than... In other words, you're, conti you're continuing sidewalk projects until you finish a particular project, right? Correct. Years ago, they were doing a piece and then going somewhere else and doing another piece, never finishing a single piece. Yes, we're focused. We're still focusing on completing sidewalks in particular areas. That that's correct. And we focus our sidewalk projects. We typically focus on um, you know major corridors, uh, commercial, and schools. And we get a, quite a bit of input from the um, transportation services division or department, as well as you know what areas we need to look at. And while you're touching that, uh, you may have noticed, I'm sure the public has noticed, that in the downtown area there have been, pick a number, 50, 60, 70, 80 handicap ramps put in the last three or four months. Those were not funded by the city. They were funded through the DOT that grant, and Anthony and his staff did an excellent job finding that money because those projects are not on the state system. New Bridge Street is obviously a city street. And yet, pick a number, there are at least 20 new handicap ramps put on there. That is part of your ADA plan, which you have adopted, which we're now implementing. And I think the only thing, the other thing I'd like to add is, you know, anytime we do water and sewer line repairs, you know, whether we have to cut into the street or, or tear a piece of sidewalk or anything like that, that cannot be repaired using Powell funds. So that is repaired using water and sewer funds. Uh, same with if we have to replace any uh, water lines or sewer lines in the street, we repave the trench that we've cut with water and sewer funds, not Powell funds. Now, if we do it as a combination project and we overlay the entire street, then we'll, uh, we'll do the overlay portion with Powell funds, but the trench paving where we did the utility work is done with utility funds. And once again, to close this, we did get confirmation today from the DOT that funds have been released and that Henderson will be fully resurfaced by the state this coming spring. Mayor, I know you have an item you'd like to share. You'll pass those around, please. <coughs> Right. Uh, last the last time we met, I, I mentioned something about the 2030 vision that I wanted to do something. I, I kind of referred to something like a retreat or whatever, but this is more like a strategic planning session and, or, and also an organizational introspection uh, to see where we're at, where we're going to be a decade from now, through this next decade, what kind of challenges we're going to be facing, you know, what are some of the opportunities you're going to have. And I think this would be a good time for us to get together as a council and discuss some of these things. And this is the first, this is a draft here. Uh, feel free to add anything or make suggestions on anything that may uh, improve this. But uh, this would be something that we would do in front of I've talked with, uh, with another edition of VA News. I've talked with Dr. Woodruff. Uh, about uh, doing this and, and using his staff to uh, be able to provide us with the accurate numbers and all that would be essential for us to be able to go forward with this analysis. Uh, if you look on your paper there, um, 
again, it says 2030 vision uh, through analysis of all the aspects of city services. And you'll see here, it lists many of them, our financial forecasts. Now, what we're looking at as far as tax base growth, uh, changes in property in, in property tax, uh, sales tax growth, water and sewer uh, revenues, and other, other sources of revenue. Uh, our expense forecast, what we're looking at, you know, we've got some major issues that we're going to be facing here as a city as far as expenses uh, that are, are, are about to creep up on us or have already crept up on us. One being the uh, uh, retirement system, you know, is uh, wanting to go up. I think what we said was $1.2 million over the next three years, four years, four years, four yes. years. And this $1.2 million will stay with us right. until they decide to raise it again. So, uh, you know, that's a, that's a challenge. And uh, we've got to look at our, our, our competitive wages. You know, we, we want to make sure that we're able to staff our organization with people that are capable of, uh, you know, doing the job our citizens expect or, or you know, provide the services our citizens have come to expect. And uh, also, uh, COLAs, we got to look at COLAs, uh, some of the benefits. We've got health insurance uh, situations there that we need to look at closely. I think you're going to get me num get us numbers for the health insurance and where we're failing and where we're succeeding on that. Also, uh, look at some of our personnel issues that we're going to be dealing with over the next 10 years. You know, we got uh, some retirements that may come up, you know, in the next 10 years uh, that's going to change uh, how our city operates. So we're going to have to uh, actually uh, look at making some replacements at some point. Uh, Look at the projections of staffing our different departments. Um, look at our long-term debt uh, as far as you know, what we're borrowing and what we'll have to borrow in the future as far as uh, the things uh, like from our general fund uh, items, water and sewer fund, our stormwater fund. Uh, look at uh, a lot of items of uh, equipment uh, replacement we're going to have to look at. That, you know, these, are, these aren't cheap. These are not, not inexpensive issues that we're looking at in the future. Our capital improvements, you can see we have many uh, in general fund projects, water and sewer projects, stormwater projects, all these uh, trans, uh, transportation major projects. And we're also looking at regulatory changes that, that may uh, need to be put in place, such as rate studies, community studies, and business practice studies. Um, that's just briefly until we get together. Uh, I, I thought this was a good start. And, uh, any comments or additions, or do you think it's a waste of time, or, or it should be good, it should be good. Yes. We haven't done it in a while. We haven't done it in a while. Well, let me give you one example. Uh, the mayor, when he talked to me about this, and he was asking about health insurance. Uh, we currently have a fund, $5.5 million health insurance fund. We're self-funded. It's our program. It's operated uh, through Blue Cross Blue Shield as the administrator, but it's our program. It's fully funded either by the taxpayer contributing through what the general fund and the other funds pay, or through the taxpayer through the salaries and what city employees contribute from their salaries. So either way, the money comes from the taxpayer. If you assume just a 5% increase per year in health care, which I think all of us would pray that it would stay that low. At 5%, in 2030, that same program is going to go from $5.5 million to $8.9 million. That's just at 5% per year. If you look at the second page, under Area 5 IT, the replacement of our IT program, which we're currently beginning to study, is going to have to occur in the next three to five years. That's a four to five million dollar purchase. You know, when the mayor talked to me about this internal analysis, I have to be honest with you, I never even thought about it. But he's hit upon something that's essential. It's like anything in your life. Can you afford the future? And you can't wait for the future to get here to figure out what the future is going to cost you. So as a manager, I can tell you, when he talked to me about it, I 100% support 
this level of analysis. It's essential. And we would encourage you to suggest other areas. And it is an analysis that I believe your staff should do and is capable of doing. And it's something that we can do within the next week. I'm sorry, did I say the next week? week? 52 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say it's hard, <laughs> hard to plan a decade in a week. <laughs> uh, we, we, uh, Dr. Woodruff and I have had several conversations about this, and you know, we've been kind of working on it for a little while. So, uh, I'm think, in favor for sure. How do you propose agree. doing this? Uh, I would assume that uh, whenever we get uh, sufficient information together on all these topics that we're talking about here, we would set a date and probably have a special meeting. Would that be the best way to do that? What do well, you think? Well, uh, what I would suggest is that we, uh, you know, it's like eating the old hot dog. Uh, I know y'all eat hamburgers, but I eat hot dogs, as you know. Uh, let us work it up from a staff standpoint, and as we, as we create the uh, information, we will begin to feed it to you a little at a time. Now, we're not gonna drag this out and we're not gonna just have five minutes worth. We'll try to submit it to you in sufficient detail where maybe over four or five presentations, you can begin to see what I'll call the chapters of the report. Does that sound like a reasonable plan? Mr. Bittner, you've done these in your professional well, I think, career. Yeah, I think we should. The only question is I think there should be some priority given to these, these areas some hinge on others more so than uh, you might think. Well, I would welcome, and I, I hope the council would not mind this, uh, you spent many years in this chair, so I would welcome your uh, thoughts uh, to assist as we plan the schedule for work. Is that acceptable to the council? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes to me. Mm -hmm. Is it set up? All right. Is there anybody? Anybody else? Everybody. Everybody is in agreement. Yes. Of course. So let's go ahead and have a motion to adjourn. So it's all business. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye.